Changes the way that something is done, thought about, or made. And to elaborate upon the game changers in primary healthcare, we have amongst us Dr. Gautam Sen from HealthSpring Medical Centers. Dr. Sen is a founding chairman of HealthSpring Medical Centers. Sir is a senior consultant in surgery, practicing for the past three and a half decades, and is now Professor Emeritus in Surgery for Grant Medical College, University of Mumbai. He is currently Director of Surgical Education at the Association of Surgeons of India, Chairman of College of Surgeons of India, and President of the Association for Trauma Care of India. Sir is also the Founding Secretary and Past Chairman of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh Indian Chapter. Sir was awarded Honorable Member of Surgical Society of Nepal for his outstanding contribution in the development of postgraduate surgical education in Nepal. Dr. Sen established HealthSpring Community Medical Centers in 2009 to bring high quality primary care to India and to transform Indian healthcare delivery. May I now invite Dr. Gautam Sen from HealthSpring Medical Centers to kindly deliberate upon the topic of game changers in primary healthcare. Thank you for your kind introduction. It's a great feeling to be in this great city of Pune, a city synonymous with abode of learning, and city having a great tradition of culture, values, knowledge, wisdom, a city where great thinkers of modern times resided, including the great educationist Padma Bhushan, Dr. S. B. Muzumdar. To be invited to give a guest lecture in this great university, which is also a synonymous with abode of modern learning institution, which is of great innovation and great intellectual rigor. And to share some of my humble thoughts on what is perhaps required to transform our healthcare delivery with August gathering here today is truly a very humbling experience. And I'm approaching my subject with great trepidation. I'm really grateful to your dean, Dr. Rajiv Yervadkar, and his young team of future knowledge leaders of India for having given me this opportunity. I'm also thankful to the vice chancellor, Professor Dr. Rajni Gupta, and I'm also thankful to Dr. Vidya Yervadkar, principal director of this great institution. Let me start with a story. And this story is a real story, and it takes you back to somewhere in 1942, when the great independence struggle was at its pinnacle. Quit India movement had come in. There's a lot of activities going on all over the country. And here was a young surgeon. He had just passed out and finished his training, though born in Bengal, but educated in Bihar, Patna Medical College, who took up a job of chief medical officer in a small municipal hospital. In those days, and probably still is, a very God-forsaken place in the state of Maharashtra. He came there to settle, 
Why he came there, that's another story altogether. But he came there. And he was perhaps the only trained surgeon in the whole of Khandesh. And this subdivisional town, for your interest, where Sane Guruji started his career, Gokhale spent a couple of months, and Nathpai later on also spent some time in this small town of Maharashtra. There, within a couple of years, 1942, 43, 44, he became a household name. He was a surgeon, but most of his time he was doing primary care. As we, later on, many years later, of course, being director of so many things and the surgeon and all that, 70% of my career has been to take care of primary care kind of needs of my patients as well as my friends and relatives all over the country. So similarly, he was the pure primary care physician, very highly trained surgeon. Way back in 42, 43, going towards home visit in Tangas, and soon his uh, reputation spread. He went to the villages far away, at times in Tanga, crossing the river, going in Belgadi, visiting these unfortunate ill patients without any health care. And he visited their houses at day or night, any time. And one of these occasions, he visited a young man in faraway village from this subdivisional town. And he realized that he was actually a freedom fighter who had gone under, uh, underground at that time. And he diagnosed him to having typhoid fever. And at that time, there was no chloramphenicol. No, the best of the antibiotics which came later on was not available then. All was available was some sulfadiazine and IV fluids to be given to a highly, a person with high fever to take care of him or his physical, physiological needs and derangements. And that's what he did. And he could not see him during the day because he was underground freedom fighter. He had to go at night at 2 o'clock, travel all the way across the river, cross the river, get into the bullock cart, go to this village, and sit with this. Those days, there were no IV fluids stand. There was no IV fluids made. These fluids were made by him in that municipal hospital with the compounder. And they were carried in bottles, which were all sterilized and taken there. And he gave that IV fluid. He sat with the patient for three to four hours. And when the IV fluid was over early morning at 3.34, he would again come back home. This happened for eight, 10 days. And then the person relation that they came and they said there's no need. He's absolutely all right. He has gone away from there. And that the story didn't end. Of course, this doctor went on. He became a legendary figure. 25, 30 years later, that small subdivisional town had opening of cotton exchange. And to their surprise, the defense minister of India decided to come and inaugurate that cotton exchange. Of course, when he came there, this doctor by now was quite matured, aging, and he was already a legendary figure. He was sitting in front row because being an eminent citizen of that small town, he was sitting there. And this defense minister came. There was all paraphernalia. He came by helicopter, by the way, defense minister of India. And he suddenly looked in the front seat and he got down from the seat, went rushing towards this doctor. And to everyone's surprise and to great embarrassment of this doctor, he did his pranam. So doctor got up, he said, what are you doing? He said, you saved my life 35, 40 years ago.
that was primary care at its best. And this presentation of mine is actually dedicated to people like him, people like the doctors of yesteryear, the great family physicians. They were not cut out to be family physicians. Some of them were gynecologists, obstetricians, some of them were surgeons, some of them were cardiologists. But they took over themselves of serving the community for their primary care needs because no such help was available then. There were no super specialists by then. So this photograph done in 1837 really represents what primary care, what health care is all about. A doctor sitting in a dim lit small dwelling where the child there is probably about to die. The doctor doesn't have any kind of peripheralia. He doesn't have any assistant. He doesn't have any of these antibiotics. He doesn't know what to do, but he spends all the night during this stormy period while the parents are watching anxiously. The compassion, the ethics, the dedication, where is it? Where it has all disappeared? We have done a great progress from the days of Sushrut to this kind of scenario as you always see great hospital. They are doing a wonderful job. I'm not saying anything about it. But is that the healthcare need of our country? What has happened when the doctors who were supposed to be God, the healthcare institutions were something like temples, has now everyone has taken their great frustrations on them and they have started even beating them. The doctors are being beaten, the hospitals vandalized. We, the healthcare providers, whether administrators, whether the CEOs of the major hospitals, or the great super specialists like us, some of us, we should ask this question, what has happened, and why it has happened, and what can be done? The consumer perception today, what was in 1942, has now changed into the doctors are non-communicative. We cannot talk to them. They are beyond our approach. The cost is prohibitive. The medical bill, as always, is opaque. You take any medical bill from any hospital with due respect to them, it is opaque. Nobody takes effort to explain to the patient what has happened and why the bill has come to this level. Failure of treatment is now considered as callous medical and paramedical staff. And that's why all the negligence issues are coming in. And that's how all the medical legal issues are coming in. Medical profession and hospitals, the public perception is they're out to make money. That's the perception, whether we like it or not. And the emergency response is really absent. When we really need them, there's no one there to take care of us. That's the perception of the public, and that's where we have come. From the 1942 onwards, now in 2014, this is what is happening. The doctors are beating up, the hospitals are vandalized, and this is the public perception. The public perception of Ajka doctor is this. And there's nothing wrong in that, which is most of the time it is so. We have done a great progress, there's no doubt about it. And that's what um, uh, most of the time um, government reminds us that we have done a great progress. Hospitals bed have increased from 1,17,000 to now 8,75,000. Doctors from 61,000 to now 6 lakhs. Medical colleges from 23 at the time of independence to now 381 medical colleges, one of the largest number of medical colleges anywhere else in the world. But in spite of that, in spite of that, 
the statistics of our health outcome is really, really grim. And let's look at that in the next few slides. India, we talk greatly, you know, from 35, we have our life expectancy has grown to 65. Great, let's pat our back. But if you compare with even our neighbors with less economy, we are nowhere. I've chosen Sri Lanka. Our under five mortality rate, that is the probability of dying before the age of five, is 61 per thousand live birth, as compared to Sri Lanka's 12. Forget about other countries, forget about other uh, developed world. Our maternal mortality rate is 200 per 100,000 live birth, as compared to Sri Lanka's 35. Our under one immunization rate is somewhere about 75%, while in Sri Lanka it's 90%. And the last but not least is the most important figure, that 65% of our population do not have proper sanitation. Can you imagine? 65% of our population do not have proper sanitation or public health utilities as compared to Sri Lanka's 9%. So I will go through this quickly and I'm sure being management uh, students and many of you are already managers, you already know all these figures. But just to show that India is somewhere amongst the worst countries in which the major health outcomes, as I said, 61, are the only, uh, uh, we are slightly better than Pakistan. But even Bangladesh, Nepal is better than us. Of course, Sri Lanka is far ahead. Uh, Malaysia is far ahead. China and UK, you cannot even catch them in the next 50 years. Maternal mortality again. Is, isn't it shameful that we are so high up while all other developed countries, you know, see where from where to where, there's hardly anything. Life expectancy of which we are very proud of, we stand at the end. Today, life expectancy is 83, 80, 75, 74, 69. Bhutan, Nepal have got better life expectancy than India. And as I said, the 65% of the population uh, lives below any normal sanitation. India is being hit by a double whammy. While we all make ourselves very proud to feel that, you know, we have one over smallpox, but so has all other countries. We not only have not conquered communicable diseases, as other countries have. Look at this communicable disease. Look at Brazil, look at uh, any countries. There's hardly anything red there. Sri Lanka, of course, much lower. But we also have now chronic diseases. So we have a double whammy of both non-communicable diseases as well as communicable diseases, thanks to our progress in healthcare delivery. Healthcare workforce, if you look into this, in spite of 381 medical colleges, we still have 6.5 doctors per 1,000 uh, population, or per 10,000 population. And if, and that is nowhere as compared to the developed world where we aspire to be. But if you look at the nursing population, the backbone of healthcare, we are again nowhere. We are nowhere. Even Sri Lanka has a better kind of figures about nursing healthcare workforce. And this workforce on top of that, not only in numbers, but they are all upgraded. While all throughout our years, we have downgraded the nursing profession from uh, 
BSc nursing to state enrolled nursing to AM workers to DAIs. While it may be right, pragmatic, practical to be so, but we must, must think in terms of high quality nursing profession which is being rewarded and recognized in the healthcare delivery system. Of course, we do not have paramedics at all. I would like to congratulate Symbiosis for having thought about paramedic training many, many years ago. And I, I would also suggest uh, Symbiosis to think in terms of getting into the primary care education and training right from doctors to the nurses and the paramedics. If you look at the total health care expenditure again, of the, it is really shameful. Um, I just, uh, if you compare it with any other country, um, uh, our expenditure on health is so poor that really you don't want to talk about it. At the initial stages uh, during independence, it was 5% of the GDP, which was very good, which came down to 4.3. And now it's 3.3. And in spite of such a low expenditure on health by the government, that shows, of course, what they really think about health. The government thinks all big talks about health and education is our primary focus. It's not. But in spite of such low expenditure, their share is only 20%, 25 to 30%. The majority of that expenditure is coming from us, from people from private out-of-pocket expenditure. Please think about it. Now, before I go into the primary care, let us start looking at what is happening in the world of today from 1980s onwards. I'll go through it quickly. That the community is now getting far better in its socioeconomic development Migrations are taking place. Cost of care and balance is all the time problem. There's a globalization. Man-made diseases like trauma and iatrogenic diseases have come in. Lifestyle changes have come in. And the life expectancy, of course, has gone in, gone up. The simple doctor-patient relationship and access to care as was there in 1942, when this doctor went all across, crossed the river, went to that uh, Jhopri's and sat down with the patient for 10 days, 10 nights, and come back again and start serving the population there, that has now changed. It is now crowded with all kinds of support system, which is good, which is required. We, doctor is now a team leader, there is a competence, safety issues, law and ethics, and that's why this seminar is coming into the, one of the law, law is a part of the seminar, obsolescence issues. So world is changing. And so is uh, the medical um, uh, progress from 80s onwards. And I would like you to just Look at this technology explosion. So many things have happened, but there is definitely a technology explosion has taken place from 1970s onwards. And since then, our attention shifted from basic foundation needs of people to the tertiary care level without any kind of offense meant to great five-star hospitals. Our, our whole attention shifted to them. The technology explosion in medicine from 70s to 85 brought in this concept of latest diagnostic equipments, latest interventional procedures, latest pharmaceutical molecules. And this technology push in medicine from 70s to 85 was only used for tertiary care for 10% actual healthcare need of the population. Healthcare as a commodity to be sold with eye on profiteering, not making good profit, but on profiteering. And of course, the public was brainwashed with latest medicines, diagnostic procedures, treatment modules, 
and super specialist and five star culture taking care of end of stage of their disease. So the new demands in healthcare has workforce has gone in from acute care to chronic care, from disease based knowledge and practice, from simple healthcare delivery to complex delivery arrangements. The doctor patient team has now changed and it has now become a care team. The trust based provider service has now changed into changing provider patient relationship which is now market driven economy. There is nothing wrong in that. But there is a wide variety of patients in multiple situations, locations being treated by multiple healthcare professionals. And the consumer uh, uh, perception has also changed. It now wants to stay healthy. It wants to get better and cured from illness. It wants to cope with continuing illness and comorbid condition. It wants to live in great dignity with chronic illnesses and disability. And it wants to cope also with the end of life situation. So let's look at these great uh, uh, countries including our neighbors, where the outcomes have been far better. What is common? And can we at least go and learn from them? And what we found, that what you will find, that they all of them have a strong public health background. They also have a strong and effective high quality primary care network with referral to tertiary care. Government's commitment to major allotment of healthcare budget is 70% social recognition and reward and the primary care medical education as, as rigorous as any other specialty. In fact, the primary care physician is considered as a specialist in developed country. In India, after MBBS, you can become family physician. DNB has started a family medicine specialty for three years, but it's still in, at say, undergraduate level. While in the UK, the MRCGP, the primary care physician, is a PG degree. And it's a six years post MBBS training. USA, it's MD internal medicine, which is seven years post basic degree. So you see how much importance they give to the primary care physician. Not only they give importance in training, because it is a specialty, but it also gives them importance by giving them, rewarding them better in terms of salary and recognition in the uh, in the uh, 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 in their uh, in their uh, profession in the USA patient protection and affordable care act of 2010 which allocates a major funding initiative to improve primary care services with universal access in australia the national primary health care strategic framework 80% of the total budget on health is given on primary care Uh, I'm told that I've got two minutes left, so I will try to go fast in this. So a strong primary care network in Sri Lanka with specialists in community health centers and Thailand, the government's emphasis on primary care and public health issues. So let me, uh, so as you can see, there is an inverse relationship between the percent of percentage of primary care physicians and the cost of health care. In Great Britain, where 65% of the doctors are primary care physicians, the expenditure is 7% of the GDP. Canada, which is 45%, is 9% of the GDP. While in USA, only 25% of the people who go for primary care medicine or primary care physician, the cost has gone up to 15% of the GDP. So new paradigm shift of healthcare delivery in 21st century is P4 medicine. It's predictive medicine, preventive medicine, participative medicine, and personalized medicine. I think as I come to, my, to the end of my slides, uh, I had something to, be show, to show, but I think the time is over. So what I will do is I will go to the last bit of my recommendation. And what is a primary care? Is it primary level of care as we all think? And that's what the government thinks. 
So provide less trained individuals at less salary down the career line, BRHMS, Ayush for that matter? Or is it the most important level of care deserving the utmost importance and respect it deserves by the society, professionals and healthcare providers? In developed worlds, they already realized this. Their whole medical education and training has changed. Societal issues have come forward and the career structure is there for a primary care physician. High cost, high quality primary care at affordable cost can only happen with 